If you look at the very first section of the first page of your handout, you'll see some things in caps. These are sound bites that I think with when I am uh, orienting myself in this primary material, and I invite you to use them too as you track my argument in this lecture. The first is that gods run in the blood, which is to say, another way to put this, in antiquity, gods and the humans who worship them form family groups spelled out at the bottom of the first page. Cult is really an ethnic and a family designation, and ethnic designations are cultic designations, which is the second point of um, those sound bites. In other words, not only is ethnicity encoded in cult for humans, but gods are also ethnic in antiquity. Gods are no less ethnic, and this is certainly true for the Judean god, the god of Israel, no less than uh, the gods of Rome is the god of a specific people, and this is a principle that Paul holds to, and um, that's a thread we'll trace through his, um, through his letters. The third point I wanna make is that ancient cities are religious institutions. Ancient cities are not secular spaces. They are large collectivities of humans, but, the, the defense of the city and its well-being depends on its positive relationship with the gods who preside over the well-being of the city. A lot of urban culture, theater, competitions, athletic events, oratory, government begin with animal sacrifices or incense to the gods who preside over the city. The goal of the city is to keep the gods happy, and the way they do that is, at my fourth point, through showing respect publicly through cult. Cult can mean blood offerings, but it also means any kind of offerings, including, uh, including prayer. Um, cult makes gods happy, and uh, the implication of this is a happy god makes for a happy city. If, if your God is happy, then you will probably be a happy human. Uh, the correlate is that unhappy gods make for unhappy humans. And we'll see Paul express this thought uh, when we turn to some of the excerpts I've made from his letters. Another point of anti in antiquity that is important for us to remember if we want to reimagine ourselves back into Paul's situation and the situation of his audience is that in antiquity, all gods exist. All gods exist. And one of the common sense empirical proofs that they exist is the existence of their individual people. So it's a God congested universe. You are born into obligations to a certain God. Please come, there are seats here. You're born into obligations to certain gods and um, paganism, pagan culture, Hellenistic culture generally was comfortable with showing respect to more than only the gods one is immediately obligated to, but one is immediately obligated um, to one's own gods, beginning with ancestors and family gods and going out to the level of the city and eventually with the Roman Empire to the uh, level of the empire. So what we think of as, um, as religion is in a sense ancestral custom. There is no word for religion in antiquity. Cult, more or less, functions the same way, but it's really you inherit the gods you worship, and you inherit the protocols by which you worship them. Uh, uh, something very important to know in antiquity, after, other than all gods existing, is that any god is more powerful than any human, which is another reason why you never want to get on the bad side of a god, anybody's god, if you can possibly avoid it. Um, in antiquity. And finally, a correlate of this, in antiquity, all monotheists are polytheists by modern definition. And I include ancient Jews in this and I include Paul in this. In other words, just because a person, let's say a Hellenistic Jew, is committed to the worship of his own ancestral god according to the protocols he's inherited from his family and his people, it doesn't mean that he thinks that no other gods exist. That's a modern definition of monotheism. Ancient monotheism is messier than modern monotheism, and I'm going to illustrate how that's the case as we continue.
The Bible also acknowledges the existence of other gods, and certainly um, first century Jews like Philo of Alexandria and like Paul the Apostle do as well. So um, I have two quotations, one from Micha, one from um, Exodus. The point about Micha is simply one of the many points you can, I'm sure any of us can think of places in Psalms and so on where the gods of the nations are referred to. Once the text comes into Greek, there's an interesting acknowledgement on the part of the translators who are probably translating the Bible in Alexandria around minus 200, that the Greek gods, unlike the Canaanite gods, the Greek gods are embedded in urban culture. The Greek gods represent and preside over good Greek educations, which a lot of these Jews have. And so when they look at the Hebrew text for Exodus 22, 27, which says, do not revile God, into the Greek it becomes, do not revile the gods. Don't talk disrespectfully of the gods. Um, another verse I didn't put down here, but I'll mention Psalm 95, 5 in Greek says, the gods of the nations are daimones. It's the Greek word that becomes, obviously, you can hear it, our English word, demon. But a daimon in, um, in Hellenistic Greek is a lower god, a god who's literally not as high up in the universe as, as the high god is. It's a geocentric universe, and Earth is in the middle, and uh, the closer a god is to Earth, the less elevated he is celestially and cosmically. So calling the gods of the nations daimones is a way very nicely of uh, the Greek translator of Psalms to not only acknowledge the existence of these other gods, but to subordinate them to the God of Israel, since they, they, he's calling them lower gods, daimones. Philo of Alexandria, an elder contemporary of Jesus and of Paul, comments when he's uh, doing his commentary on Exodus, that reviling each other's gods always causes war. He's commenting on the verse in 22, 28 that says no, don't revile the gods. And the reason you don't do that is for peace. And he also says in the same passage that Jews should show respect for pagan rulers, quote, who are of the same seed as the gods. He also, when describing the creation of the universe, getting to the creation of stars and planets, calls the heavenly firmament, quote, the most holy dwelling place of the manifest and visible teoi, the manifest and visible gods. Not only in this uh, cosmic way and in, this, in, this, in the universe of biblical commentary do other gods show up, but other gods also figure in something called kinship diplomacy. In antiquity, different cities would enter into political treaties with each other by discovering that they had a distant ancestor in common, and usually this distant ancestor would be the product of two gods. And if you know your Greek mythology, you know that uh, Greek gods had a tendency to leave a trail of human children um, behind them. Well, the Jewish god, didn't act like this. He did not have uh, human offspring, but Jews were still part of the diplomatic and political universe of Hellenistic antiquity. And what we have in the book of the Maccabees, um, it's book 12, I think I made a note to, yeah. It's in book 12, I'm sorry, uh, book one of the Maccabees, chapter 12. It's also reported, the same tradition as reported in, in Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews, book 12, is that Spartans and Judeans are one genos. They're one race or one tribe because of a distant common ancestor that was born from, it's not clear if it's a marriage or just a date, but Hercules, goes out with one of the granddaughters of Abraham. There's no comment made either in the Antiquities by Josephus or by the author of the Maccabees. There's no comment on the fact that Abraham's granddaughter um, was dating a non-Jewish chatan. But this is, this is a Jewish 
diplomatic tradition that's in no, no less patriotically Jewish a book than um, Maccabees, which is, I'm trying to give you a sense of how realistically these gods impose upon how people live their lives in the Hellenistic Mediterranean. Uh, finally, two uh, quotations from Paul's letters, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Paul says in 1st Corinthians, although there are many go so-called gods in heaven and on earth, and indeed, there are many gods and many lords, and he's talking to his pagans in Corinth, yet for us, there is only one God, the Father. So he's not saying to these pagans, get with the program, your gods don't exist. What he's saying is, yeah, yeah, I know that there are lots of other gods, but I want you to worship only my God, who is the highest God, says, says Paul. And then in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he mentions, and we'll get back to this verse again, that the God of this cosmos, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Paul not only knows that these other gods exist, he is suffering from their effects. And we'll find out why these other gods are hassling Paul uh, in the course of this lecture. This acknowledgement of the gods of other nations did not extend in general to sacrificing to the gods of other nations. Jews in general, and we know about this partly because of pagan complaints that Jews aren't pulling their weight in terms of taking care of the cities where they live. Jews don't do Lytreia, they don't do cult to foreign gods in principle. Nonetheless, there are many other ways of showing respect. And this is a Mediterranean culture and being shown respect and being seen to show respect matters um, a great deal. And what you have here in this next section is the, is the acknowledgement that we have in different inscriptions of Jews who are paying respect to the gods of the nations while not exactly, they're not uh, actually sacrificing to them, that would be out of line, but they are acknowledging them and being, uh, being respectful to them. And the first, um, the first example, this is from uh, minus third century, Maskos, who identifies himself as a Jew, Eudaios, frees a slave, quote, having seen a dream at the orders of the god Ampharos and Hygienia. Hygienia, just as you'd expect, is the goddess of, I think for is the goddess of dental floss. She's the goddess of cleanliness and good health. Uh, these two gods showed up in a dream to Moscos, who's a Jew, but he knows what these gods look like. Why? How does he know? How can he identify them when they show up in a dream? Statues, that's right. His city would be filled with statues of these gods. So he, they come to him, they say you should free your slave, and when a god tells you to jump, the only correct response is, how high? So Moscos um, liberates his slave, as these gods asked him to do, and luckily for us, he did it in the temple of these gods, and uh, left a, um, a votive message acknowledging this, and it got carved in stone, which is why people uh, much later on uh, could find it and find out about Moschus's dream. This is the sort of thing you wouldn't expect to find in a biblical text, but you do find it in this, these other types of evidence that we have at the periphery and the sort of um, off-trail evidence that you can get from, uh, from inscriptions. 